Maria Kim from University of New South Wales in Australia. Today I'm going to talk about the ripple down rules based name entity recognition for the web document. The web is very important and attractive IA resources since it has huge amount of uh, information, especially unstructured text. Um, but unfortunately, most of um, web texts are written without strict supervision, like a journalist text, so such as blogs, comments, tweets. So user can write anything, and it often have a uh, ungrammatical or incomplete sentences, and also it has many of um, formal informal abbreviations of vocabularies. Therefore, we get to errors, which significantly worsens the overall IE performance. NER it identifies proper nouns and classifies them into a set of categories, such as personal location and organizations, and has a, it's been having two basic approaches. One is the knowledge based, and which use the most um, explicit resources such as rules or gadgeteers, usually handcrafted rules, and therefore it has, it gives more accuracy, but consumes, it has a high time consumption and cost, has a high cost as well. On the other hand, the learning-based approach it uses statistics or machine learning based. It doesn't require like language engineers, but we need to have a large amount of the label training set, which is it's pretty hard to cover for the web data set. There's been two type of approaches for the web scale NER. One is semi-supervised learning. It usually rely on the large amount of web resources and web redundancy to cover the precision. But it doesn't have much concern on the web's informality. So those approaches usually use the more journalistic text rather than actual web text, because it's pretty hard to label informal web text. And also, there are some studies improving the gadgeteers from web resources. It improved the coverage of uh, web domains and web vocabularies, but still, they usually use pretty simpler approach so that it contains lots of web noise. As a result, it confuses some the analysis methodologies in uh, NER systems. I have used the approach on the, based on ripple down rules. But before I explain the RDR rules, I'd like to explain the, okay, the difference between user classifier and the RDR approach. In this example, we'd like to classify between green boards and red stars. Firstly, we have a very simple classifier such as a rectangle here, and it missed one green ball, which we supposed to have it, and it had the incorrect classification of red stars. So there we managed to have a better classifier, more sophisticated oval shaped classifier, but still missing one green ball and incorrect classification of uh, red stars. Then we use very, very sophisticated classifier, which covers all the green balls and excluding all red stars. But later, after we develop this classifier, when the case occurs, which is incorrectly classified, then we need to go back to the drawing board again to create new classifier. The ripple down rules have a different approach. So, ripple down rules creates rules 
each time when we have uh, unseen cases. For example, we have uh, one green ball cases here, and we create a simple rule to cover this one case. And then system keep running. And when we have an uh, incorrect classification, such as red star here, and then user creates another exception rule to exclu exclude that red star. The here important thing is the user should distinguish this incorrect, classifi incorrect classification from the, our existing system. And the system keep running. So as a result, we have uh, seven rules added to cover those green stars, which look very similar to previous, very sophisticated, our classifier. The difference between previous classifier and this one is when we have a new unseen cases which are incorrectly classified, we don't have to develop new the classifier. Instead, we can just add one more rule to exclude that red star, red circle, not star, sorry. So RDL gives a number of advantages, has very intuitive I'm knowledge. Going to have a question, sorry, I don't know. Um, let's go to the mission creation, let's set the country. So there's. That was a big surprise. Everyone, <laughs> welcome. Okay, so yeah, I continue. Yeah. <laughs> I'm awake. Yeah. The ripple down rules provides a number of advantages. It has a very intuitive knowledge acquisition process, and it doesn't require the knowledge engineer to develop the classifier. And the new knowledge is validated as it acquired, and it supports it support incremental learning rather than upfront learning. So when we have a certain domain which cannot be <laughs> Yeah. So when we are dealing with a certain domain which you cannot predict all kinds of characteristics such as a web and with like informal web those Can I continue? Okay, I will continue. Yes, at the most uh, tricky part of refer down rules is um, it doesn't require upfront learning up from knowledge, you don't have to predict all the characteristics of the domain. It can, you can learn. You can learn incrementally. So that as you learn about the particular domain, yeah, you can improve the, the process of knowledge acquisition. Yeah, and the good part is um, the user, the expert, doesn't have to understand the structure of the existing knowledge base. They don't have to worry where the newly created rule gonna be positioned or any conflict. And the rule creation is very simple and rapid. So today I will explain about RDA-based NER system. I, I just call it RDA NER system. Is um, the, we use the wrap approach to the one of um, the famous Stanford NES system to handle web's informality in the domain of interest. <coughs> the underlying idea is we use the state of the art NES system, usually use machine learning based NES system, and try to correct the errors of those system, which is caused by special web's informality, which is uh, hard to predict and hard to deal with the machine learning base because they, it's hard to get 
the label data for the informal web text. And yeah, and it's pretty easy to handle those errors, which is it's trivial for the human generated rules, but it's pretty hard to deal with the label training data. In our RDR NER system, we chose the Stanford NER system after we compare with the other three systems, such as Stanford NER system and GATE system and LBJ system. We found that Stanford NER system brought us the most uh, stable precision recall on the web text. So we chose Stanford NER system, but any other system can be used. And after we analyzed the Stanford NER system, we found we categorized five types of um, error, errors based on the informal, informal web text. First one is um, around 40 percentage of the errors caused by new vocabulary, such as YouTube, not seen in the training set or not in the dictionary of the system and around 25% of errors were caused by the machine learning inconsistency. So such as within, with, even within the same sentence, one Kafka was tagged as a person or the other Kafka is tagged as a location, which is um, pretty hard to understand why it's happening or how to fix it. Yeah. And around 21% of errors caused by the informal capital letter issues. You, uh, many web texts usually using the capital letters because users just want to emphasize what they're writing. And it often causes errors with the existing NER systems. So you can see Google acquire YouTube because they acquire starting with the capital letter, all three tokens tag as organization as a one NER system, many things happen like this. And for the 10% of the error caused by the lack of trigger words, for example, when, when we have 1.5 million without dollar sign, it was all missed with the NER system. And finally, the number of web noises, such as uh, spelling errors or symbols or excessive abbreviations. So the last example, the Google was misclassified as, as a non-name entity because it was just next to plus. So IDEA NEA system has um, three main components, preprocessor and our base NEA system, which is uh, Stanford NEA system, and we have uh, RDA knowledge base learner. So preprocessor the, accept the web text and it tags um, it tags, our case, it tags um, power of speech and noun and verb phrase chunks. But we can have uh, more NLP resources to create rules, but we just try to stick with the basic components. And Stanford NER tags name entity on each tagged tokens. And it goes through. It goes to the RDA knowledge based learner. So we it accepts the classification from Stanford NER, and when the user sees, so decides whether the classification is correct, and we simply save it. But when it's incorrect, then user start creating rules. And then when the rule is before it rule is uh, saved to the existing knowledge base, it checks whether it's had any conflict with existing knowledge base. If there's no conflict, it's going to be saved. If there's conflicts with previous seen cases, you just need to refine those rules. Here I will show very, very simple examples when we construct initial knowledge base. So first we have our R0, which is the Default condition is always true and returns no classification. So when the case one enters in the empty knowledge base, the user gets no classification, and user decide to add the rules to classify the friend Kafka, which was uh, not tagged as a name entity, and it tagged as a person. 
And when second case enters, the rule one gonna be fired because there's a French Kafka. But again, user justify that it's incorrect because it's not person, it's a French Kafka museum, which is supposed to be location. Then user as a exception rule on the fire the rule, which is R1. So we said when French Kafka is followed by the word <coughs> museum, we we tag it as a location. And then when third case enters the system, again, R0 gonna be fired since it's newly seen cases. And you just add another rule under the default rule R0 to cover those. So the user gonna keep continue building knowledge base as they see unseen cases. In RDA based system, user interface is um, very important. It's it should be it should hide all the complexity and give more intuitive the process so that user can add the rules. I mean, user can like how can I say it? Okay, let me just go through. Okay, so firstly the each sentence is going to display in one section, and the user clicks the, the classification button, and the automatically the classification result is going to come up from the, our knowledge base. And user clicks the NFV features button, and they can see all the NFV features. As I explained, we have uh, tokens, power of speech, and noun, verb phrase chunk, and name entities. But it's possible we can add up more NFP features if that helps to building rules. And when the user <coughs> decides this classification is incorrect and gonna create new rules under the fired rules, and the draft rule will be displayed in the right section. And before saving those newly created rules, you just should go through the evaluation process. And if there is no conflict, you just can simply save it. We use the MIR data set to, uh, to check the performance of our RDNA system. MIR data set is, has, contains um, sentences collected from Google search engine by submitting the query like uh, to give an argument uh, between the seven wild cards. Mm -hmm. So it mainly contains corporate acquisition and personal birthplace relations. And out of 4,206 sentences, we chose 341 sentences as our test data set and 200 sentences chose as training data set. And we built the initial knowledge base with these 200 sentences and 231 cases occurred, and it was covered by 44 new rules and 39 exception rules within four hours of training. And we got following result. So Stanford NER system, was, when it was tested in our test data set, it got 87.1% of precision and 69% of recall and 67% of, 76% uh, of F1 score. And RDA NS system could improve after four hours training up to 92% of precision and 88% of recall and 90% of F1 score. So as we can see, after we have a four hours training of knowledge base and we improve STEM for any system up to 90.48%, which is very close to the STEM for any system's state-of-the-art performance, 90.8% when it was tested on a journalistic text. So web scale, NER is very important, but it's pretty difficult, especially due to the web's informality. And RDR-based approach gives number of advantages. It doesn't require any training data, and it, don't have, it doesn't rely on web to redundancy. It's pretty easy to correct errors incrementally, and rule creation is very simple and rapid. And for future work, we 
are planning to have more experiment on various domains such as Twitter or Facebook has a more high level of noise and yeah, it, which requires more flexibility. Yes. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. No, you. Ah, okay. <laughs> With the microphone. Yeah, but. Ah. Ah, okay. <laughs> I didn't get it yet. Okay, maybe in a couple of days. <laughs> okay. Now, now that's a, that, that's a cute idea, but the, uh, the problem is that just to produce the ripple down rules, although they are simple to to uh, to produce, uh, this look pretty interesting to do in a crowdsourced way. So suppose you have no this large results from uh, an identity recognition, and then you, um, you know, submit it to. Uh, large set of people and uh, try to produce have you have you thought about that yeah, some people have interest in uh, having the cross sourcing knowledge base so different set of people create the the rules at the same time we combine those things but still it's very challengeable task as people i mean the rules can be Really, and a good point of idea is that you can make very flexible rule to cover the, those domains, but the difficult part is hard to make it standardized and combining. That's basically from, it's very flexible and means it's hard to be standardized. So still it's a challenge, challenge of a task and people working on that, but. Oh, Was only source of an expert by the rules. Yes. So you don't need any crowdsourcing for somebody that she can do it now today. So the cost is much lower than you and I were thinking. Well, apparently on this uh, corpus, uh, four hours is not so bad. Uh, although I was a bit surprised by your four hours because you wrote um, it's something like 80 rules. Hours, which is like a one rule every three minutes. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I've done a lot. Know, the knowledge acquisition that I was involved in, we could never get three minutes per rule. So how come that you had such a high speed? I think it's not only me get high speed. As, um, I can refer the <coughs> paper, which was uh, last written written last year and it has a uh, how many uh, how long it would take as the rule number of rules <coughs> increasing after it gets more than 5,000 rules where they would take more time to create rules but still it just take around three minutes to a maximum 10 minutes mm -hmm. to create one rule after you have uh, more than 5,000 to 10,000 rules in the system I think the reason is because the user doesn't have to consider where the rule is supposed to be. And when, it, when you add new rules, and if you get some conflict with the existing rules, it's still pretty easy to get exceptional rules. I mean, it, there's, you, you need to just exclude a few features to differentiate your rule from the existing rules. So, yeah. Hello, uh, I may miss uh, understood something, but h how how differs your approach from just building a gazetteer of, of uh, yeah with some named entities and just looking up those? Uh, the second question actually is regarding generalization. How could I generalize to unseen uh, named entities? So, for for uh, yeah the example you showed, uh, if you find friends museum, it's okay. But what if I found yeah, Madame Tissot uh, Museum or so. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sleepy. Um, so I couldn't get the first question, sorry. You generate some rules if you find a name followed by museum, then it should be location. So um, does it differ from just building an, uh, a gazetteer with, with named entities? So I just put the uh, yeah, this friend's museum as a location, and, and then the only friends as an, a person, and so on. So does it differ from building just a gazetteer with all named entities you have? Or? So I you can think, because I only showed the very simple rules with using only the token, and the difference between just uh, adding all the, why not adding new vocabulary to keep adding the gazetteers? Because um, the refer down rules, you, how can I say that? So when you have a, if you have a, like a back of words, you keep adding, increasing the dictionaries. And when there's some kind of um, the analysis methodology you're using on the NER system, and when it conflicts with your gadgeteers, how can we solve it? There's an, it's not easy to solve it. You, whether you're gonna clean your whole huge gadgeteers or rebuilding it. But the, the good point, it's, it looks very similar, you're adding it, but RDR, as I said, you can just add one more exception rules for those particular case, rather than rebuilding whole gadgeteers for the general case. Does it make sense? Yes. Maybe we can discuss it. Yes. You define the rules in the level of the entity. So you have a specific, a specific rule saying that if Franz Kafka is identified as, uh, as a, a particular type of token, then do that. So this is relevant to the question, to the previous question. How ca can this be generalized to unseen uh, entities? Because in the end, this is not much usable if you have one million entities, one million locations or people to, to identify. Um, I think that's um, based on what kinds of cases you're gonna see. Because the first, the motivation doing this study was <laughs> when we use, we have a lot of good NER systems already existing. And when I apply those things to the web text, I got lots of errors with, because there's something really missing or like there's plus there or minus there, or that as I showed that dollar sign is missing. And it's very trivial cases a lot, but it accumulates when, I mean, there's no reason, no, no way to fix those trivial errors. And finally, it affected I, I, my main study was extracting information using those NFP tools. And when I do those information extraction, it was too much affecting my performance because of the trivial errors. And I wanted to clean and fix this. And that's the main reason I got up to here. So. Like patching up the, the, problem, the problematic results of the, of the initial parser, is that correct? Yes, oh, sorry. So better for future use. That's my perception. I think the strength of this approach is um, you, I, we cannot define I mean, you cannot define like 100% sure what kind of um, informal web text we're gonna meet, we're gonna see before we develop certain system as uh, we get Twitters or blogs every day, they are creating new types of um, the informality based on users. So this one, the good point is, who can fix those informality which is created every day? Basically, <coughs> I thought that's the user who create those things. So this approach, give you the way to use the, re the user's feedback to fix those newly created informal characteristics. Okay, thank you. That kind of leads on to my question, which um, I know this is part of your future work, but um, Adapting this stuff to work on really dirty texts like um, tweets, um, Facebook posts, and so on, I'm kind of nervous that, that your system will actually be able to perform on those kind of texts because the kind of errors you get are really quite irregular. 
Um, so, for example, Stanford parser drops, the named entity recognizer drops significantly. I think it's something like 40%. Um, I, I don't remember the exact figure, but I know it's, um, it drops very, very significantly. Um, and the, the kind of errors you get, as I say, I, I think you'll just be fixing like individual errors, but um, on, on any kind of unseen social media, I think you're really going to struggle. But I mean, it'll be really interesting to see how you do. So I just wondered if you've got any thoughts about um, our next study, like what type of um, the writing styles in a, which we can usually meet in the Twitters or blog. And then we should be study first, and we're going to come up with uh, those rules which is particularly fitting to clean those type of writings. Yes, there will be. There's, there's a certain amount that you can. So, for example, there's lots of work on um, cleaning up S SMS messages, for example, dealing with text speak. And there's a lot of regular stuff you can fix, but there's also an incredible amount of irregular stuff. Um, so I think I, 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 I think you may struggle, but I mean all all systems tend to struggle in those kind of texts. So it's very much an unsolved problem, but it'll be interesting to see anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Without any of the coffee breaks, so. Uh...